current law requires discretionary spending to stay relatively flat in fiscal year 2016 in comparison to 2015. So this subcommittee's challenge will be to find the money within to pay for the have-to-dos and make progress on the should-dos, all without cutting the popular nice-to-dos by so much that we can't pass a bill. Before we turn to our first panel, let me uh, first ask our distinguished ranking member, Ms. McCollum, for any opening remarks she may wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to the panel. I appreciate all of you being here to discuss the fiscal year 2016 budget request for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education. While Native American programs in this budget request are a trust responsibility to the Department of Interior, I believe that they're a moral responsibility for each one of us. And I'm pleased to see that the increases proposed in this budget to help advance the social and economic well-being of Native Americans. I especially want to commend you on the additional funds aimed at improving Indian education. Mr. Washburn, last August you and Secretary Jewell visited, uh, as we affectionately call it, the Bug School on the Leech Lake Reservation in Minnesota. You and the Secretary saw firsthand the deplorable conditions that these students and faculty have to put up with every day. And that's why I'm very pleased to see the proposed um, $58.7 million increase in the Indian uh, education school construction and appreciate the mention of the Bug School in Secretary Jill's testimony on Wednesday. It meant a lot to those children. There's a lot to like in this budget. It brings broadband to all BIE schools over three years. Uh, funds contract support costs fully. It increases Native American scholarship, expands social services, including Indian and child welfare programs, increasing uh, energy development uh, in Indian country, and enhancing uh, tribal law and order. Now, my enthusiasm for these increases is tempered by the fiscal and political climate in which we're operating. On Wednesday, our chairman, Chairman Calvert, warned Secretary Joel, and I think he wisely did so representing the views within his caucus, that many of the budget increases that the Secretary was proposing were unattainable in the current budget situation. Now, I believe President Obama has offered a plan to eliminate sequestration and get us out of this fiscal straitjacket that the Budget Act control puts us in. But now members on the other side of the aisle may not support the President's plan. But I do believe, as the Chairman said, it's incumbent on all of us to address these problems. I, for one, do not want to have to say that we can uh, not have these needed increases for Indian Affairs or that we can only do them with radical cuts to other important programs in the Interior Environment Appropriations Bill. That's just not a process I'll be able to support. But I want to be clear, this is not an extravagant budget. Like many other parts of the interior budget, when adjusted for inflation, we are currently spending on Indian Affairs less than we did in 2005. In fact, even with the proposed increases in Indian construction, we would be spending just half of what we spent in construction in 2005. I've always appreciated and I'm very proud of the bipartisan manner in which the subcommittees work together to address Native American needs and programs. And we work together to strive for solutions that, uh, you know, enhance and protect Indian self-government and self-determination. So Assistant Secretary Washburn, I think you would agree money alone won't solve this problem in Indian country. But I believe that you understand that there needs to be significant reforms in the delivery of service to Native Americans. So I appreciate um, you and the other witnesses being here today. I look forward to your insights on these important matters. I look forward to your testimony. And Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working together to find solutions. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Washburn, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Ranking Member, um, former Chairman, um, Mr. Cole and other members. Um, I want to thank you for your support. I have to really begin by thanking you really seriously. In, this, um, in recent years, this committee on many issues has been out in front of the administration on leadership and support for Indian Country. And um, the roughly 9,000 employees of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education and my own staff thank you for your support of our work. It's meant a lot to us and it's meant a lot to everyone in Indian country. And I want to tell you this year, um, the President's uh, request is um, um, matches your own leadership in Indian country. 
The President's budget request it totals $2.9 billion for our Indian Affairs programs, and that's $323.5 million more than the current um, enacted level. I thank you for, you, for you for your past support and hope that you will support and continue your strong bipartisan support for Indian Country. You and I know that many of the programs, in fact, a majority of the programs are actually run by tribes out in Indian Country. About 68 percent of this budget will effectively go directly to tribes so that they can run our programs because they do a lot better running our programs than, than we do in many respects. Our federal appropriations have sometimes run on a time principle that is slow. It is what some of my friends in Indian Country have started calling federal time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we are often late in doing our jobs, and let me own a lot of that on our end, because we don't, after the money um, gets apportioned to us, we are sometimes slow getting it out the door, and my Deputy Assistant Secretary, Tommy Thompson, is working really hard so we can get the money out faster. Part of that's on Congress, though. This year, we didn't get a fiscal year budget for this year until middle of December. And um, when that happens, when we have a you know, continuing resolution, then we get a budget, we have to do everything twice. And sometimes it's three times. I mean, and so we, it really helps us if you will have a budget, <coughs> even if it's not everything we want, but if you have it ready to go October 1, so, and we do it once, because that makes life a lot easier for all those people that have to push money out every time there's a change in the budget. So I, I encourage you and urge you to um, try to, you know, if you can help us get a budget out soon, it'll be good for Indian Country. Let me give you some good news about this year's request, and I'd like to help this subcommittee out of that tight spot that you mentioned, Chairman, when you gave your opening remarks. This President's budget supports a real all-of-government approach to Indian Country. And so I want to talk first about what's not in our budget. And let me tell you how this came about. We, we, we've got a lot of stuff that helps us, but it's in other parts of the budget. Um, President um, Obama um, set up a White House Native American Affairs Council and appointed Sally Jewell as the chair of that council. And one of the first things she did was to say to OMB, you know, we need to be breaking down silos in the federal government. One of the best places we can do that is with budgeting. And so for the first time in history this year as we prepared our budget, OMB brought multiple agencies together and started talking about the President's priorities in Indian Country and said, how can we all work together to meet these? So. For example, one of the things we got out of that is in uh, uh, something that helps my budget very much, um, or helps my the problems I'm trying to address very much, is teacher housing. And so there's $10 million in the HUD budget for teacher housing in this proposal. So that won't come to this subcommittee, but it nevertheless will help us meet these goals. Um, if you, uh, some of you were at the State of the Union address, I think I saw you on TV. Um, one of the things the President's uh, request for community colleges does is it supports tribal colleges as well. So the President has offered, in essence, to uh, ask Congress to provide for paying for tuition for two years for community colleges, but that would include tribal colleges as well. So that's a huge boost for tribal colleges um, that comes out of, um, well, Mr. Cole, I'm sorry to put that on you, but I think that comes out <laughs> of your subcommittee's budget. But that we're trying to spread this around. We're trying to take care of these priorities by looking beyond just my budget. So one other big um, avenue in that respect is um, the Department of Education. Arne Duncan has changed some eligil eligibility rules for their early childhood education programs. It used to be that only states could apply for the money in those programs, and he's changing those eligibility rules so tribes can apply for those programs, too. And you all know how important early childhood education is. I know you personally know that. So tribes will have more access to that kind of funding. So it's not just in our FACE program line, but it will um, also be Department of Education money. So let me talk about, those are all things that are not in our budget, but nevertheless very, very helpful, and not in you know, your specific requ requirements, um, with the exception of, of Tom over there. <laughs> uh, put a lot on his plate. Um, our budget request for the Bureau of Indian Ed Education, which is really our highest priority this year, increases our budget request to about a billion dollars. Um, a lot of this is for school construction, but it's for a lot of other things as well. We are working diligently to make the Bureau of Indian Education more effective. Um, the Secretary, about more than a year ago, asked, started an st uh, education study group and made me the chair, and Mr. Russell has been on that and several other people, including some um, team members from, one formerly from the Department of Defense, um, who have recently upgraded their schools. 
and also someone from the Department of Education. So we've had a really good team working on this, how can we improve education? And so there's a lot of money requests in here, but we are also trying to um, clean up the house at the Bureau of Indian Education so it works better. So we, I won't go through line by line, but there's a huge increase requested to support that and to ensure that we can spend that money properly and we can make things better for Indians on the ground. I think you all know the importance of contract support costs, so let me just meet, uh, um, you know, quickly mention, um, honestly, um, the appropriations committees in the report language sort of alluded to mandatory funding, um, and um, we are working with our authorizing committees as well to try to get that um, sort of off of the appropriations committee's plate and into a different pot so that it um, makes it easier for tribes to count on that funding. And I know that's a big lift. Um, I know it needs your support. I know it's not um, right down um, in your portfolio, but it needs your support. We have a bunch of specific things in the budget that are very, very important. For example, a $4.5 million office to um, help with India, an Indian Ener Energy Service Center because we've heard for a long time that we need to help tribes more with permitting and it cuts across um, several agency lines. And so that $4.5 million request is really important and that would support not just us but also the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies that have so much work to do in Indian country. I don't want to go on and on and on and filibuster this thing, so I'm going to stop here, but let me let you know that I've got Director Mike Black with me and Director Monty Russell with me, and I will be uh, asking them to help me answer your questions because we want to make sure you get good answers today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, with regard to the 183 elementary and secondary schools in the Bureau of Indian Education System, uh, so we can direct today's questions accordingly, please differentiate and clarify for us the various roles and responsibilities of the Assistant Secretary's Office, the BIA, and the BIE. Okay, Chairman, um, w I could answer that question in about three hours. Um, <laughs> but what I've done about is... Three, about three minutes. Fair enough. <laughs> That is, the pro that is a big part of the problem, frankly. That's right. We've given you this two and a half inch book that hopefully is more than a doorstop, and there is a there is a org chart in this book um, that uh, partially answers that question. The part of the problem is that question is really evolving right now because we have published a bl blueprint for Indian education that will change these things dramatically mm -hmm. and hopefully align accountability a little bit more clearly um, with powers and responsibilities in Indian country. So we are working working really hard on that and on a weekly basis we've been having big meetings of our team that's trying to accomplish this and there's a lot of subcommittees to that team too and I think as you know some of those um, um, requirements are going to be reprogramming um, requests potentially coming over here. It's really hard to change anything in the federal government. It takes a lot of mother may eyes um, and a lot of um, people who, uh, many people can veto it. So it's been, I have to say, one of the most challenging things I've ever seen in my life trying to get this done. But we are really trying to realign the Bureau of Indian Education, the roles and responsibilities there, as well as in, within um, the BIA to be more supportive of education. And um, it has been really challenging, but it's very much an evolving um, process right now. While we're on the subject of education, I was, we were out in uh, recently uh, Navajo country and Hopi country and we saw the condition of some of the schools and obviously throughout Indian country, it's one of the big issues is, is obviously uh, Ms. McCollum has a school that desperately needs to be replaced. As, uh, but this uh, list is a lot longer than just those schools. And uh, we had a discussion about thinking outside the box about how do we, we had a, a similar situation a number of years ago with Department of Defense schools uh, condition and uh, we came up with an interesting way to finance this. Uh, as you know, most schools in America are not paid for on an annual budget process, they're paid through bond financing over a 30 year period and how we can potentially set up a financing mechanism where we don't have to account for the full dollar amount, but be able to expand the number of schools that we're attempting to renovate and replace uh, and, uh, and get some, maybe some expert uh, outside financial help to come up with a model, maybe looking at Department of Defense, and get, re get a resolution to a, a large number of these schools quickly rather than just having to come back here hat in hand year after year chipping away at this at this iceberg 
Have you, have you put any thought into that? Chairman, ye yes, and uh, a little bit. And you, you raised that with us, and we've been looking into it a bit. Um, we, we talked to the folks at the Department of Defense and that assisted with that. Um, you know, they did a big makeover of their schools to the tune of, um, I, I believe, in excess of $1 billion and perhaps in excess of $2 billion. Um, they looked at some similar financing arrangements. And when we talked to our person on our staff who worked in, uh, on that um, um, reform, reconstruction of, of defense schools, um, said, you know, there's 17 different reasons why this doesn't work, this, uh, you know, alternative financing models. Um, and so we're, we're still looking at it, and we've raised it with OMB as well to try to, we, we do want to be creative here. Um, but, um, you know, we, one of the basic problems, we do have a different problem than what state schools have because we don't have a tax base for floating bonds and that sort of thing. But we want to commend you for your creative thinking around these things, and we need to be doing creative thinking too. So if you keep putting those things on our plates, we will keep considering well, I'm going to look into this more because I think you've got to find a way to yes on something like this. I mean, there's got to be a, certainly a better way than when you're doing it now. That's not working. I mean, we're not... We're, we're going to be 100 years before we take care of the, the, the necessities that you have to, on the brick and mortar side. I mean, that doesn't really address the other issues you have in education, but certainly the brick and mortar issue has to be resolved. And that's, a, you know, from a business guy's point of view, I would think that would be a relatively simple thing to do if you think about it, mm -hmm. focus in on it, and understand how you do it, and, and try to get people to yes to get this, to get this thing fixed. Because, uh, as uh, Mr. Simpson said, that, that some of these schools are just, just beyond uh, an embarrassment. They are chairman. Um, in the defense side, they, they largely ponied up the money to do it, and they did it over multiple years. And that's kind of what we have in mind is, you know, with the, it, that it's probably a, a five to six to seven year plan um, for reconstructing our worst schools. And then we need, we definitely need, you know, more attention to just maintaining those schools, the preventative maintenance type stuff. Yeah. But, well, but I have some other questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Ms. McCollum right now. We'll get, get through the panel. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kind of following uh, up on, on that, um, and you just mentioned the increase for replacement school construction. Is that sufficient to finish off the priority list developed over a decade in uh, 2004? Yes, ma'am, it is. And it would also allow us to plan for those schools that will be on the priority list for the, the next priority list, um, to plan so that we can hit, you know, be out of the gates with construction um, for the next fiscal year. Well, I was I was pleased to see that so that we're not making a choice, you know, that we need to have both, both lines of money mo moving forward. So I was happy to see that. Um, what is the timetable for developing the new school priority list? It's something, you know, we're being asked all around Indian country uh, because we'd like to know if we're going to have time to consider incorporating uh, that preliminary funding in, into the bill that uh, the, we're going to be working on here in this committee. Um, so, and then I, I had a great conversation with Secretary Jewell, and we've talked about it too, about how you have brought people in from DOD, from the Department of uh, Interior Parks and that to kind of develop this list. So when do we expect to see it and will we have a clear, understandable list of criteria that everybody can, you know, rally around? Not be happy if we don't have the money to go do it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being pie in the sky here, but is this going to be clear? Well, the criteria was developed according to a negotiated rulemaking that we were required to do by Congress. And so, it, it, you know, we had a team put together a formula, and it was a uh, representative of members from Indian Country, actually including um, Director Russell in a former job, was on that team. So um, I think it's a formula that uh, was developed, you know, by a committee um, in, in, in all the best ways because it's widely representative. Um, we are currently trying to make sure we've got good data to plug into that formula. And actually, we're making great progress there. Um, we certainly intend to have that um, list out this year. Um, we probably will have it out this summer. Um, I ha hate to make promises about anything that is not entirely within my control, but um, we are working diligently to try to get that list out. I'm responsible for holding that up because I didn't want to put a new list out until we'd made a commitment to all the schools that were on the 2004 list and got that done. I okay. thought that that was really important before we start developing new expectations. All right. Well, I 
as, as everybody here has been pushing, as you said, we need to get off a of federal time on doing this. Um, uh, schools and counts. So this is another count we've been waiting for, Johnson O'Malley. Uh, since I've been on the committee, the Johnson O'Malley, you know, is, is pending, it's coming, it's coming. So my question is, uh, what's the time frame for that new count? But then I have a question about the count in and of itself. The Census Bureau um, is uh, changing the way in which it does its, collects its, its information. And I wonder if we had better census information for Indian Country, it would give uh, you folks here at the table a much clearer picture and help us plan better for all your needs and services. So what has been your interaction with the Census Bureau? And whether it's Johnson O'Malley or when I had the honor of being with um, Ms. Pingree at, um, at uh, Beatrice Rafferty or whether we're in Hopi or Indian Country, I mean, the principals there are saying, you know, what you're, what you're projecting for enrollment, they know is wrong. Mm -hmm. So how do we get our count straight? Well, let me say this, and I'm going to ask Director Russell to address the Johnson O'Malley question, but let me talk more broadly about the census question. Tribes don't fully trust the processes that the Census Bureau uses, and I think that they are, um, you know, Census Bureau are experts on, on these things, and we have to work with the Census Bureau. But, but, we but, but the new form doesn't ask the question, are you Native American? Well, that's interesting, and we, we need to talk to them more about that. We, we've, we have to work with the census because they truly are the experts. We, you all require us to be experts in nearly everything under the sun in Indian country. Consequently, we do nothing well in Indian country. If you ask us to be an expert in everything, we, we can't be, and we, we will do nothing well if we're spread too thin, and that's, this is one of our great frustrations. Um, and so we have to work with other experts in the federal government like the census. Let me turn it over to Director Russell to talk about the JOM count. Okay, thank you. Um, we just re um, completed the JOM count for 14. Uh, we are in the process of going out for consultation to tribes. We've set that out. It's been in the Federal Register. And we're looking at two different things. One is we have the count to talk about it, but then we have some discrepancies there. Uh, you know, ver a lot of new contractors have submitted. A lot of contractors, and contractors, I mean tribes or school districts, did not submit a count. So trying to figure out why they did that and why they didn't do that, you know, is, is one of the issues that we're faced with. The other is how then do we distribute the funds? Again, and so that's part of the consultation process. Rather than make that decision ourselves, we want to go out to consultation and hear from the tribes and the schools what's the best way to, to, to distribute those funds once we have them. In terms of the census and uh, JOM, one of the issues that comes there is that, you know, of course, census or, or in prior years was self-reported or self-identified, I mean. With ours, there's a, uh, the definition of who is an Indian and the, 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 that definition. So there's two different reasons or two different criteria that would be used. And so again, we want to take that question out to consultation and hear from tribes. It's one thing to hear from the organization, but hear from the tribes because there are a lot of definitions out there of who is an enrolled member. And so we're doing the consultations in April, and so we should be able then to distribute the funds. So we're moving on it quickly right now. Thank you. Mr. Cole. Mr. Was that? Oh, Mr. Simpson, excuse me. <laughs> I, 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 I cited Tom there's, yesterday, there's, so there's I nothing, felt guilty. So there's nothing more former than a former chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, yeah. no problem. And I don't really have so much as questions. I'm going to submit a bunch of questions for the, uh, for the record dealing with uh, that have uh, been questions from the Choban tribe about the sixth grade expansion and paying for that and a few things like that. And I appreciate your help in, in uh, making sure that that got done. Uh, but this, we're kind of concentrating on schools. And if you look over the last several years at this committee, we've, we concentrated on health care because that was substantially under par and needed to be brought up. And so we've increased funding for that and contract support and all of that type of thing. Now we're kind of concentrating on schools while maintaining the concentration on health care. But that doesn't cover it all. Uh, I'm also concerned about uh, the, the uh, police protection and so forth on reservations or the lack thereof, uh, the incredible distance that uh, 
that uh, or the area that tribes have in reservations and stuff with very few officers and the and the danger that that causes and the violence against women that occurs on on uh, reservations and the alcohol problems that uh, occur oftentimes just on the border of the reservation <laughs> when somebody sets up a community there and, and and causes problems and I still remember from the when we were visiting I think it was the Rosebud see the Rosebud or Pine, Pine Ridge when we talked to the police officer there and uh, they had just lost a police officer that had been on duty for I can't remember how many hours but just fell off the road mm -hmm. you know and uh, it's a real problem. So it, it, it's not to suggest that education is the only thing we've got to deal with. There's a lot of other things that we've got to deal with also. But we have been focusing on this this education. And uh, I, you know, I, uh, the article that I mentioned the other day when uh, Secretary Jewell was here about, that was in the Minneapolis paper, that while I congratulated the administration for their education budget, said that at this rate it would take 30 years to address the needs that exist currently. We can't wait 30 years. At that rate, we have kids going to the schools now whose kids will be going to schools that haven't been fixed yet. Uh, so we've got we've to find a better way to do this. And what I would want is the administration and the department to place before us a plan of how, you're gonna, how you, are you going to replace these schools uh, and bring them up to speed because as the ranking member Ms. McCollum has said before and I agree with it is that how you, where, you, where you send our kids the conditions of the schools that they go into it says a lot about what we think about our kids mm -hmm. and it says a lot to them about what we think about them mm -hmm. uh, so we've got to do a, a much better job and I think we've got to have a shorter time frame in how to address these schools and I am going to be a little bit pie in the sky and that we've got to find a plan to do it and fund it. And I don't have the answer yet. I know the chairman has some ideas, but we need to start debating this. And how do you put together the priority list and how far down does it go? I mean, because I want to know what the whole realm is. And I'm not talking about building castles. I look at it sort of like when a school district goes out for a bond, they put everything out there that they would like and the voters reject it because it's too much and then they come back and pare it down and say okay what's necessary you know and I suspect if you put out a list of uh, schools that need uh, need help every every tribe in the country would have oh we need this done we need this done but how do you put together a priority list and how far down does it go because there are needs all across uh, the country well, Chairman, you're absolutely right. There are, it's, a, it's a real challenge. I want to thank you for all the support of IHS for the last few years because that has made a real difference in Indian country, and we need to make the same kind of difference in Indian education for sure. And we, just, we, are not a, we don't have the resources to be fully holistic on everything we need to do. Right. We need to focus on poor schools, but we also need to be a lot more strategic. And so one of the things we've added to our budget this year is a new line. We've also always had this school construction line and that we've n never funded nearly enough, right. but it sort of looks at whole campuses. We've added a line for facility construction. So for example, take the bug school. The elementary school is actually fairly nice. The high school is deplorable. And so, but, but we average out that school to see what the level of the campus is. We need to have um, the ability to be more strategic and to go in and surgically improve buildings. When there's one bad building um, that's really bad, we need to be able to do that. We have over 1,700 school buildings. And, uh, you know, we are just, it's, it's overwhelming. It's yeah. really overwhelming. But we have to be strategic. We do think it's a multi-year plan. If you gave us a billion dollars for next year, um, to address all the backlog, we wouldn't be able to spend it responsibly. We don't have the infrastructure to do that. And, um, you know, we have to develop that infrastructure. And I think the GAO has pointed that out well, that the things that we need to do, we know what we need to do. So, so we won't ask you for money that we can't responsibly spend. Um, but we do need to have a serious focus on this over the next five years at least, and probably more like six or seven. Well, what I'd like to see before the committee is, is a plan to address it in as short an order as we could do it. I realize it's not going to be done in one year, so that we could actually uh, debate it here in committee and say, okay, where are we going to come up with the funds, guys, and, uh, and get it done. That's the, that's the only way you're going to do it, same way we did it with health care. And, uh, and then, as I said, there are a lot of different issues that, that need to be addressed. We can't ignore uh, safety on the reservations and other things also. How are we using, are we using uh, 
detention centers, regional detention centers, uh, to any extent. And I know that it causes challenges because every mm -hmm. tribe wants their own. Well, we can't afford to build one everywhere. So it seems like it makes sense to me. Are we doing that at all? We are doing that, and we're actually even using private detention centers uh, facilities to some degree, too, because it's cost effective. And um, let me say, if you look back over the 10 years, we've built only about 20 schools, and a lot of that was with our money. We've built about twice that many detention centers. Do you want to be building detention centers, or do you want to be building schools? And that's kind of the issue that we face directly it's that's and that's a challenge because you do need detention centers you saw the one the one at Hopi uh, you know yeah. it is that one needs to be you know replaced however um, you know how cynical do you want to be you, you want to yeah. be build schools or detention centers do you want to add anything to that director black well let me let me just say for you do of and um, I know I'm taking my time but uh, one of the other issues is the education in those detention centers that we've got to address Thank you. And we actually are working directly on that. We've got, uh, we've put these two guys together, frankly, to work on those issues. So we've got the BIE working much more closely with our de juvenile detention centers. Thank you. Uh, before I go to, to, uh, to our next, uh, Mr. Kilmer, one point that, uh, that we saw when we were up at the Navajo Hopi country is that the, is that there apparently was a Navajo detention center that was underutilized, but they didn't want to put the Hopis in the Navajo, uh, I mean, and it, that, of course, from, from our perspective, that didn't make a lot of sense, but there may be other reasons. It makes I, an I, awful I, lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes worse. But, uh, yeah, well. Centuries of history. Yeah, okay, there. all right. Uh, Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we're talking about detention centers, I actually had a question. I'm, I'm concerned that the BIA budget doesn't request any additional funds for the operation. Of, of tribal detention facilities. Um, uh, we've got one that was located in my state, operated by the Puyallup tribe. And, you know, despite the fact the facility, that the facility was constructed in close coordination with BIA um, and the uh, Division of Justice Services, the tribe's only been given less than 30 percent of the funding uh, needed to actually operate the facility. And, and frankly, had they known that it was going to depend on tribal resources to operate it, I'm not sure they would have moved forward with it. Um, so does the BIA believe that there's a need for additional funding for, uh, for operations of, of travel detention facilities? And, you know, after having supported construction, how do we make sure that, that this doesn't become a burden to the tribes that are operating? Congressman Kilmer, I'm going to ask Director Black to address your question because that sure. is entirely within the BIA, but thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think uh, that is something we have been able to identify over the last few years. Speaking specifically to the payoff facility, you know, we have been working very closely with the tribe since they began the planning on this facility to identify funds. And um, quite, quite honestly, you're right. You know, we do have a situation where as new facilities have come on board, and I'm going to talk to the past a little bit, DOJ was the one that was, was funding a lot of these facilities in the past. We had some coordination issues back then as far as ensuring that when these facilities were completed that we had identified the necessary funds to be able to staff them and operate them. Now, we have been able over the past four to five years to work very closely with DOJ to kind of bridge that gap and get a better coordination and identify. And we have plussed up our detention center operations staffing here over, I think it was last year, we were able to get some additional funds in there to work with the different tribes. So we, it's an issue that we are well aware of and working on and look forward to working with you all. Thanks. I'd like to work that. with you on that. Yep. Um, I also wanted to, to talk about uh, the BIA was looking to establish a one-stop uh, tribal support center to serve as a gateway to services. Um, you know, I, and I appreciate that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I do want to pass along a concern that I have, and that is that it appears that one of the major features of the One Stop Center is that it's the, uh, the, is the development of an online portal. And a lot of the tribes in my district simply don't have access to high-speed broadband. And, and uh, that's a big trouble uh, in the rural, rural areas. So what, what happens when important resources like that um, can't be accessed by the tribes that are most in need? Uh, uh, you know, how do we make sure that they're not missing out on some of these vital services? Well, thank you, Congressman. That is a big part of our budget request. We, we've real, you know, my budget's about $2.6 billion this year, and the entire cross-cut for, across the federal government for Indian country is about $19 billion. So my budget, the programs that I have for Indian country are about 15% of the programs for Indian country mm -hmm. by dollar volume. 
So what we have learned is, and we've learned that we don't need to be all in a bunch of different silos. So at least for tribes, we need to have one place where they can come and um, we can interpret, or we can be the ombudsman, we can you make sure tribes know about all the programs. And I think you are exactly right. I think that online a portal needs to be part of the solution, but it cannot be the only solution. Tribes need human beings to help them navigate these things. So we need both of those things as part of this, as part of this system. It's going to be enormously challenging, not just because of the digital divide problems, but, but the digital divide problem has plagued us in many areas, and so a lot of our schools don't have um, you know good access. The Macaw tribe and was in the state of Washington has had challenges, and we've helped them modestly with funding. We've been looking for funding from the FCC, then their E-rate program. We've been getting help from Verizon for computers and online services within schools, and we've been turning over every rock we can because we do have to solve the digital divide problem. Thank you. I sure agree with you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by making you an offer. Um, first of all, I appreciate the budget, and I appreciate uh, all the administration's doing, and thank you for the very generous words for this committee, which on a bipartisan basis really has tried to prioritize uh, these things under successive chairmen, no matter who was in the majority, and, and I think we actually have seen some tangible results from sustained attention. Uh, and if we can just keep that and, and broaden that focus, hopefully we can, we can do more. Um, Actually, in terms of, if I can get out of this subcommittee's jurisdiction to my own for a minute, uh, we, we will later have a hearing on Native American programs that span uh, health and human services. And so I would very much like to work with you and, and uh, OMB and whatever sort of unitary thing. I know Ms. McCollum's worked for a lot of years trying to identify where all the different streams of revenue are and why can't we put them into an overall budget for Indian country. Uh, so at least in the areas where I have jurisdiction, we're going to try and do that. And we want to do it obviously in cooperation with you. So if you can just help us uh, figure out where these things are, where we can bring them together, uh, we're going to have, I think, a difficult appropriations process because with all due respect, you know, the president submitted a budget, uh, you know, on the, on political assumptions in terms of what's going to pass in terms of taxes that, that are fantasy. They're not, they're not going to happen. I mean, we're more likely to be flat line. That doesn't mean you can't prioritize within that. And it doesn't mean later there can't be a larger deal. I mean, that's what I would hope for is another Ryan Murray type uh, situation. Mr. Calvert and I just came from Defense Subcommittee where I can tell you there's a lot of pretty worried people around that table about the consequences of sequester. But uh, it's not enough simply to to write a budget, propose it, you have to have a process to negotiate a settlement because it's not going to be what's envisioned in the President's budget. But again, the amount of money we're talking about in the jurisdiction I have is a comparatively small amount when you look at how vast it is. So if you would help us identify and figure out how to coordinate that, and uh, matter of fact, I, if you want to come over and testify, or Secretary Jewell did, or you, you guys put your heads together. We would love to have uh, that so it's not just a block <coughs> here from this and a block here from that, but we had somebody from the administration standpoint that, that talked about a unitary approach. Is that possible to do? Chairman, absolutely. We, we, um, actually, we've been noticing so many places in our programs that tribes just aren't able to participate um, in some program that serves states or you know, other governments or other groups. And so we have been finding lots of places where we just need to make sure that tribes are eligible to apply as well. And so we'd be delighted to help you with that. Well, let, let, let's have that conversation. One quick question, if I may. And, uh, uh, could you give us an update? I know we have a number of tribes that are, are working on VAWA uh, that are trying to, uh, you know, get themselves uh, where they've got the judicial capacity and the law enforcement capacity. How are we doing uh, where the rubber meets the road? We have, uh, uh, well, we've got, we've got three tribes that have taken on pilot programs, but come March, uh, middle of March or so, uh, every tribe in the country that wants to do it can start doing VAWA prosecutions in theory. They have to put a lot of things in place to do that, and so uh, we think that'll go kind of slow um, at first because it's quite expensive at the tribal level. We have um, funding this year in our FY15 budget, I believe, uh, I think it's about a million dollars to help train tribal courts so they can handle this new, this, so they can, you know, exercise this responsibility very well. Um, so we are desperately training and conducting a lot of training um, to, to try to make sure that tribal courts have the resources they need to put that into place properly. Okay. Okay. We're going to recess uh, for 10 minutes.
and return to this panel for uh, Ms. Pendry, and, uh, and uh, then we'll have our second panel. Thank you. Thank you.
Catch your breath, and uh, okay. you are recognized. Thank you for very your much, question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today and for your answers to the previous questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I appreciate we've had a lot of focus on Indian education. So, I can't help but ask a question about the Beatrice Rafferty School. Um, I think you all know a lot of the background, and we're extremely excited for the Passamaquoddy tribe that this money is funded and very grateful to the committee for the hard work that they've done and the ranking member for coming up to visit and I think the secretary was up there once they've gotten a lot of really great attention which they deserve and um, hopefully as people have been talking about there's going to be some real opportunities to clean up the rest of that list but they're now on the list and I'm going to try to ask this question uh, as articulately as I can, but I will admit I'm slightly confused myself. But here you are, so it's a good chance to ask the question. Um, so the disappointing thing is that um, since the announcement was made in December, they have not been able to move forward with construction because they haven't gotten a sign off from either the BAA or the BIE, but I know you're going to answer that question to me, who actually gets to manage construction. But that said, from our conversations with the tribe, um, the representative that was supposed to meet with them has failed to appear at at least two meetings. So they've had a hard time just in the communication and contact. And the challenge is over the number of square foot in, feet in the school. So we got an 11 year old design, you know, let, this is, goes back 11 years. And the BIA or the BIE has said it's the current design is 5,000 square feet too large for the financial allocation. So the, the tribe wants to negotiate this or at least have a conversation about it. And my understanding is that it's from the federal government the, the argument that they don't have sufficient funds for that. But their opinion is this 5,000 square feet, which covers some curriculum areas, the jobs for the graduate program, some of their mechanical and electrical rooms is critical to the design, and it is 11 years later. Um, I think they're trying to argue that they can do it for that dollar amount. Um, so it's just an arbitrary number, in a sense, on behalf of the BIA. I'll pick up the base here. But, um, and I'm not negotiating for them, but I think their other argument is if, in fact, you don't think they can do it for that amount of money, um, they'll use other funds. They'll, you know, they'll do something to access the rest of the funds, but then one of the arguments from the BIA is, um, well, you can't use federal government money to maintain those last 5,000 square feet. It's a 50,000 square foot building, so it's only 10%. This isn't like they've doubled the size or anything else. Um, and more than anything else, they want to get a decision. So now they're stuck. They should be going into the design phase. They should be starting work on this. And they feel like, A, they can't even get an answer. And B, I think they want the chance to argue their point a little bit. And more than anything else, I want to see them be able to go forward with the construction, given all the backlog we have. At least there's a school that should be constructed. Let's get it constructed. So um, so who does make construction decisions? And how, why has it been so hard for them to get an answer, or even my office to help out getting the answer? Well, 
Well, let me, I'm going to ask the director, Russell, to handle your question because he is in the weeds on these kinds of questions. Um, you know, keep in mind that he's got 1,700 plus school buildings and 183 different campuses that he's in charge of as well. The quick answer is, you know, we plan for construction and we had plans. And if we want to change plans, it, we got, there's a lengthy process to change those plans because we were kind of, you know, and we need, and we want to move quickly too. It's hard to change that when that ball has started to roll. But I'm going to ask Director Russell to address your question in more specificity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, the BIE has the responsibility of approving educational space. And then the Division of uh, Facility Management Construction, they approve the mechanical space, you know, how much for HVAC systems and things like that. It's actually the total amount that is above what is um, the square footage is 9,206 square feet. It's not 5,000. 5,000 is just for the educational um, programs that you talked about, the expanding the gym, um, um, the jobs for Maine, and things like that. Our office, and we've approved this, our office has approved 52% of that 5,000 space. So we've actually have not said no to it, but we've been trying to go back and forth. The requirements that we have, we have space guidelines, and one of those space guidelines, the, the responsibility of those guidelines is at one point, BIE and BIA was accused of building too big of buildings for, for some of our Indian schools, that there are vacant classrooms and things like that. So these guidelines are to help to say, here's the standard, you know, how many students for, and all this. So, so that's in place. So that's what we're going by. It's not an arbitrary mm -hmm. number that we're setting. These are space guidelines that actually are aligned with um, the standard out. And, you know, we looked at um, different states that have these same guidelines and kind of said, okay, that state's kind of like our schools. And we kind of um, picked and choose there to, to create these guidelines. So based on that, we then have these <coughs> guidelines to ensure we don't build too big of schools. So what we've said is that what the guidelines that we approve of, that's what we can fund on O&M. Anything above that, you know, otherwise we just build these really big schools that people want, but there's no justification. Nonetheless, we have agreed to over, you know, 52% of their request. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now what we're doing is that the letter has been drafted and we've worked with the school and the tribe. We met with the, the tribe, uh, tribal president came and met with our, uh, my staff a couple weeks ago right. and talked about, talked about this. I actually was on the, uh, the trip with the secretary. Um, oh, at thank that time. you. So we weren't able to, I wasn't able to be there, but the staff was there. But so we're at the process now of notifying the school and saying, this is our determination. Now the plan at this point is allowing the school, if they wanted to have something larger, they can do it through value engineering or they can do it through an alternate. So if they wanted to have a separate building or a separate classroom that's above and beyond, then they can do that as saying, okay, um, they can build it on top of what is allocated. But the plans that we have were built and created because of the, the funding that we've had, which is 19 million. It's based on a square foot amount and it gives you an idea of the footprint. Anything above that, you know, um, has to be negotiated. My responsibility is just for the educational space. The mechanical space is for about, you know, about 4,000 square feet. And so that is something that Division of um, um, Construction Management, they, they would take care of that. So we've now come to that final decision. Mm -hmm. The school should be notified in the next, we're hoping in the next few days in terms of that decision being made. Um, and they can begin the, the design process of that. So um, thank you. And I'm sure they'll be very happy to receive the letter and have a you know, more concrete answer. And just to clarify, like I said, I'm not negotiating. I don't know everything about the plan, so I don't want to get um, into too much detail here. But did you say that they could do um, something in addition to that and it wouldn't cause you to turn down their entire plan? I mean, if they had some other source of funding for a slightly larger space or there's some other add-on they want to the building as long as it's not trying to come out of the same money? Yeah, I mean, if, they, if they're able to, for example, through their negotiations with their contractors, get a really good price and, and build the extra space, they're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, 9,200 square feet actually comes out to about $2.6 million above and beyond what was allocated and funded. Um, Got it. But there's a, but whatever the um, thinking was that said they wouldn't be allowed to do it because the maintenance costs in the future would be a problem. That's not an actual. They'd argument. have to. That's a decision that they would have to make and have to figure out how they would. Um, 
um, take handle care of the operation okay. maintenance, but it wouldn't say we wouldn't say you can't do anything. You wouldn't yeah. shut down the whole building process. Okay. Well, um, oh, that's plenty of time. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. that. It it would be helpful though to iron out any differences uh, before we appropriate construction dollars uh, and on these things. Mm -hmm. If we had known about this, we could have been willing to bump up the funding and uh, resolve this. And, and if we do need to do this, do we need to, need to do this in FY16? So we would like to be, uh, you know, made, you know, made, Thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, you know, get this, uh, get us the information. And coming from that industry, I, I would say that you know the the. Uh, the two happiest words a, a contractor ever hears is uh, change order. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, get your plans set and then build to those plans. Don't uh, modify or change in the middle of a construction job. So, Mr. Chair, on, on this point, two, two, two things come to mind. You know, um, uh, Ms. Pingree was pointing out that these plans were from 10 years ago. The count, the principal was telling us that they really thought the count for the children, that th th she knew she was going to have more kids coming through that door. No. And the other thing is, if we're looking at 10-year-old plants, there's been a lot of changages in, in um, cutting-edge technology with HVAC systems and that. So as you're going through developing your new plans, my assumption, my happy assumption is you're taking as much of that as you can to, into account. Am I correct? Mr. Sumpsch, you had a question? Yeah, I got a uh, real quick question. Uh, when we were uh, out in the Hopi Navajo country, we went out to uh, one of the schools that's going to be replaced. What was the name of that? The Monk Hopi. Cove or Monk Hopi. Monk Hopi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or, no, Little Singer. Little Singer was the one. Was this the Little Singer? Yeah. We rode uh, on a bus. <laughs> out to it. I have liver damage. Now the interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing about it is, is uh, Miss McCollum and I are doing Fitbit, sitting on the bus, driving for 20 minutes out there. We got 500 steps just sitting on the bus. One way. Which yeah, one way, which tells you how bad the road was. Tell me about your roads pro uh, roads program. And I hear this also from the Cheyenne River Sioux and some other tribes. In fact, I hear from just about every tribe that comes in. If you bring it up, that they're concerned about. Uh, how we fund roads and on reservations. Thank you, Chairman. We, we have been accused of putting you in a bus that had square <laughs> wheels. We've been accused <laughs> of putting you in a bus that had no shocks. Yeah. And, um, and um, we, that's one of our serious problems. And it's, not, it's a problem all over Indian country, especially on large rural reservations. And frankly, uh, Mr. Black and I have gotten an earful about the formula for funding roads. And that's a formula developed in Congress, not by us. And so we, we know those are serious concerns. Um, I think I would, my, since, since Director Black is an engineer, I think I'll ask him <laughs> the question. <laughs> Let me just say, we have $26.6 million in our proposed budget for road maintenance. And this is an area, you know, there's a no, whole other bill that affects this area, and I think it's going to be called the Grow America Bill, but the, the reauthorization of MAP 21 is an area where there is significant money for roads. And so you know, we again, we don't want to take all of this on ourselves because there are other um, committees and other agencies with important responsibilities, and um, we even sp we do spend some of that money that comes from that bill. But we need to be uh, taking an all-government approach to this as well, Mr. Black. Yeah. And I just add a couple things to that. You know, we we currently, based on 2014 estimates, have about a 280 million dollar backlog in our road maintenance facilities. About 110,000 miles are BIA tribal. That's about 75% of our overall inventory is BIA, tribal, and county roads. And about 45% of those are bus routes. Mm -hmm. you know, and or about 45% of those are dirt and gravel roads, with the majority of them being bus routes. So it, it is a problem that we recognize. And under the previous highway bill and uh, reauthorization, you know, there was some language put in there that does allow tribes to use up to 25% of their highway construction dollars toward road maintenance. But as you know, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul because right. we have some extensive road uh, construction needs out there as well. So it is something that it, that's high on our uh, radar as far as something that we need to address. It's been an ongoing problem for multiple. I used to be a regional road engineer, so I mean, I've dealt with this for you know 15, 20 years. So it is something we got to work close with the tribes. Something you know, and, and as the reauthorization of the highway bill, because our road maintenance comes out of our Department of Interior funding. The highway bill funds our construction programs. Does it? Does the formula need to be redone? Is there an issue with the formula? Well, 
<laughs> Depending on who you talk to. No one will ever be. There is no perfect <laughs> formula out there. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Joyce. Uh, do you have any questions before I excuse this panel? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would like to address just one to Director Russell. Uh, you know, the department uh, has recently conducted an inspection of the Moenkopi Day School and located on the Hopi Reservation uh, adjacent to Tuba City, Arizona, to determine the quality of safety measures in place at the BIE-funded schools to prevent violence against students and staff from internal and external threats. The OIG founded Moenkopi Day School safety measures to be inadequate. Specifically, the school did not have a comprehensive emergency plan. In addition, training in violence prevention and emergency preparedness was found to be inadequate. Of the 18 safety measures OIG checked for, Moenkopi Day School did not have 12 in place. The OIG reports issued in 10 and 8 and 10 on the same topic concluded that schools were not prepared to prevent violence and ensure the safety of students and staff. <coughs> Moenkopi Day Schools was not among the schools previously visited. This is a serious issue. Can you point to specific position? provisions within this uh, 16 budget that will help schools such as Moenkopi Day School improve its safety measures and its violence prevention and emergency preparedness training. Thank you for that question. And um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, sir. I came here for 25 years being a prosecutor. Unfortunately, this is the, to this day, is the third year anniversary of a school which uh, unfortunately had the three kids get killed and uh, a lot of kids get wounded. So it's something near and dear to me. I'm not making light of this or trying to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure our kids are safe. No, I understand, and it's something that we take very seriously also in, in, in the operation of our schools and also in the areas that where we operate these schools. They're in very remote locations. They're in areas like Moncopi. They're in areas like, you know, Flandreau, all across this country. Specifically, what we have in the budget is, I think I would take a different approach. I think it's a, a collective approach that we're looking at. We need to try to improve the, the overall accountability of the BIE. And by doing that, it's not focusing just on safety, but it's focused on accountability in its totality. Mm -hmm. So over the past few years, we have a drop in fake, you know, uh, employees within our system. We need to turn that around and get people working in these different areas that have the responsibility of overseeing safety measures happening in schools. I know when I was a superintendent of schools, we used to have the line officer who was in charge would come out and ensure that we had our, our COOP plan, you know, and that we have, you know, had our um, fire drills and all of those things. They came out. Well, because there's no, not the employees we have there anymore, that's lapsed. So we're trying to get back to that, ensuring the accountability. The other thing, too, is, is defining whose role and responsibility. One of the problems that we have out in, in Indian country is that we have everyone doing a lot of different jobs. So defining those roles and responsibilities as part of this blueprint for reform is actually going to help in the areas of safety as well as in the areas of finance and uh, curriculum and instruction. So it's really trying to redefine what those roles and responsibilities are, clarify those roles and responsibilities, and then hold people accountable. So specific point to the um, the budget, I can't do that. Okay. But in its totality, we can do that. And that's what the blueprint for reform is, is trying to maintain and create greater accountability measures throughout the entire system. And you have an adequate funding to do that? Well, there's never enough adequate. Let me do <laughs> In your funding process, you're looking forward to doing We're that. prioritizing, and the implementation plan will help us do this, you know, in phases. And we're positive we'll get it done. Great. Thank you. I have no further Thank you. Unless one last comment. As a matter of fact, on this Mokopi school, we noticed that there were three empty houses, and you were there, I think, Kevin, and and uh, and there was this dispute between the security people and the teachers, and so the end result is those houses are sitting empty for two or three years. It drove us all crazy. You're thinking, wow, what what a what a waste. And uh, hopefully, I, I'm sure you fixed it since we've left. And we that's all resolved. <laughs> Good. We, can we leave it there? <laughs> leave it with your optimistic statement. We, we actually, we have been working on this, and um, it was two houses, um, um, one, uh, as I recall, and um, what we have done is we have tried to arm wrestle with our law enforcement folks to get those houses and perhaps make them available to teachers. They've said, no, we want to keep them, but we will fill them. Um, you may recall there was an issue about the cost of those homes, and so we are trying to do some creative work to figure out how to get the costs down so that law enforcement officers can use that home. And so we do have one rented, um, at least one rented, and um, we are working on a solution for the other one as well. Um, y you know, the, the 
local community had a lot to say about that. They wanted they, they wanted police officers in those homes. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, so I just we'll, hate to see them empty. That's I, the you, you and we, us too. Yeah. Thank you, well, Mr. Chair. To, to when you said you know that the police officers could afford to live in them. I mean, the government accounting offices determines what the rents are going to be, right? But do they do they actually look at the salaries of the federal employees who have to rent them? Well, that's a question, and it's I think it's the GSA that is Excuse involved, me, and GSA. and they're uh, and honestly, everybody's got some responsibility. There's some congressional formulas that we have to follow too. So, it's um, but that's a good question, and we are trying to figure out a way to make those house those um, spaces more affordable for those folks, and we are making some progress today. Uh, there are continued efforts to lead in the face of tremendous adversity, the traditionally high turnover rate in all three of your positions is a testament to the challenges you face. We want to see you succeed and we hope we can continue to be helpful partners so that you'll stick around for a while and see through uh, many of the improvements you're trying to make. At this time, we'll uh, excuse you from the table and invite you to take a seat in the front row while I ask the uh, second panel to, uh, to come up. And our second panel is while there. What's that? Just briefly pause. Okay, we'll just have a brief pause and change signs here. Get some fresh water out there for you all. Okay. There we go. Now we'll uh, shift gears to focus in more detail on the oversight of the VIE facilities, condition, and management. I'd like to welcome our witness from the Government Accountability Office, Melissa Emery Aris, Director of Education and GAO's Education Workforce and Security Team. Thank you for being here today and uh, agreeing to testify prior to finalizing your study so that we can have an opportunity to make any necessary course corrections in fiscal year 2016 bill. Exactly two years ago to the day, in this room, Chairman Simpson convened a similar BIE oversight hearing in which GAO testified prior to finalizing a study we had asked them to do regarding per pupil spending. GAO's testimony at that time helped the subcommittee to push this administration to make Indian education a much higher priority than before. <coughs> to its credit, clearly the administration is stepping up, but I think as we will see today, clearly we still have a long way to go. I recognize that we can help close part of that distance with more funding, but not all of it. There are some management and accountability issues and perhaps even some legislative issues that must be addressed before significant funding can follow. So Ms. Emery Aris, welcome and thank you again for being here today. You're recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank all those here, uh, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and members of the subcommittee. As you know, GAO has conducted a body of recent work on BIE schools. In prior work, we found that Indian Affairs has been hampered by key management challenges, including lack of needed expertise, insufficient oversight of school spending, and poor communication with schools. Today, I will discuss the physical condition of BIE school facilities. The Bureau of Indian Education oversees 185 schools that serve approximately 41,000 students on or near Indian reservations in 23 states. In 2014, Interior's Office of Indian Affairs funded the operations, maintenance, construction, and repair of close to 1,800 school buildings worth an estimated $4.2 billion. My remarks will cover preliminary findings from our ongoing study of these schools for your subcommittee. Specifically, I will focus on two areas. One, what is known about the condition of these schools, and two, the extent to which Indian Affairs effectively oversees and supports these school facilities. Unfortunately, Indian Affairs does not effectively track the conditions of these schools, which makes it difficult to accurately determine the number of schools in poor condition. Back in 2003, we reported on inaccurate and incomplete data entry by school officials and limited training regarding how to use the facilities database. Our ongoing work suggests that the data are still problematic. For example, officials at one school told us that they did not routinely enter information into the facilities database because their staff lacked expertise and Indian Affairs had not provided them adequate training. 
As a result, they said that the existing information in the database significantly underestimates their repair needs. We believe that inaccurate and incomplete data will continue to hinder Indian Affairs' ability to prioritize school repairs and target funding. During our ongoing work, we also visited schools in three states that reported facing a variety of facility challenges. For example, at one school, the old boilers had been deemed a major health and safety concern by the, the BIE school safety specialist. You may have seen some of the pictures in the testimony. Um, and the school often needs to close down when they fail to provide enough heat. The staff at the same school also showed us exterior doors that did not lock properly and had to be chained during school lockdowns. Many of the entrances also lacked exterior security cameras, so I think this relates to some of the safety concerns we were talking about earlier. Um, these challenges were actually highlighted during our visit to the school when they had to perform a lockdown during our visit because a student had made a Columbine-type threat. At another school, we also observed a dormitory for elementary school students with inadequate clearance between the top bunk beds and sprinkler pipes on the ceiling. You may also see that in the statement. Um, school officials told us that the students had received head injuries bumping their heads on the pipes, and some students had actually attempted suicide by hanging from them. Preliminary results from our work indicate that Indian Affairs has key long-standing management challenges that are impeding its oversight and support for these school facilities. These challenges include limited staff and expertise to address school facility needs. For example, our preliminary analysis shows that about 40% of regional facility positions are currently vacant. We also found inconsistent oversight of school construction projects. For example, at one BIE-operated school we visited, Indian Affairs managed a $3.5 million project to replace school roofs. Yet, the replacement roofs have leaked since they were installed in 2010, causing mold and ceiling damage in the classrooms. BIA officials told us late in 2014 that they weren't sure what steps, if any, Indian Affairs would take to resolve the leaks or hold the contractors or suppliers accountable. Excuse me on, oh, that, yes. on that question. Yes. How, how big a roofing job are we talking about? Oh, three point. It's, it's very large. It covers um, multiple parts of the school, including the gymnasium and many classrooms. This is one school? Yes. How, how many square feet in the school approximately? You know? We can uh, get back to you on that answer. Yeah. And was there any warranty within that contract? They're under warranty and they've been asking the manufacturer to come and fix and it's a patch job here and a patch job there and six to eight weeks later there's another leak. Huh. They think it has to do with the way that the seams were constructed um, so that it's not a permanent fix. So they keep bringing the manufacturer back but nothing happens. So there are real defects in how it was installed. Excuse me for interruption. Oh, if there are any other questions, please go for it. This is all very troubling. Uh, um, I, I got a question. Who yes. represents you? I'm sorry? Who represents you? Do you have a, a legal office or a Department of Justice or somebody represents you to take a action on that? Oh, um, in terms of what the legal options are for yes. the Department of Interior? Um, that um, we would leave to uh, the Interior Department to uh, respond to, but there are potential legal claims that could be made against the supplier or the manufacturer. We should. Thank you. Sure. Um, in addition, uh, we found uh, poor communication with schools. For example, at another school we visited, officials told us that they had submitted a request for a new hot water heater because their elementary school lacked hot water. Yet, Indian Affairs officials were unaware of this situation until we brought it to their attention. As a result, students and staff at the school went without hot water for about a year, and it wasn't fixed until after a month after we spoke with interior officials. Hey, excuse me. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that illegal? Yeah. Yeah. That's a it's a, we find it troubling. Yeah, okay. There are, there are concerns about um, yeah, the safety and health without the hot water. 
Uh, in conclusion, our preliminary findings show that Indian Affairs continues to face challenges and unless these are addressed, some students will continue to be educated in poor facilities. We will continue to monitor, monitor these issues as we complete our work and consider any recommendations that may be needed. Thank you. This concludes my statement. Thank you. Uh, your written testimony states that you visited uh, 12 BIE schools. Would you please elaborate on the conditions you observed at the schools, including any uh, health and safety hazards? Sure. Uh, we visited 12 schools in three states, and we chose them so that they would represent a range of conditions. Um, however, some of those that were listed and we thought better shape in the database ended up not being so uh, when we actually went to see them. Um, we found many um, things that concerned us. For example, and I think there's a picture of this in the written statement as well, we found a high voltage electrical panel that was installed next to a dishwasher at a school cafeteria. So this is a situation where you have a lot of water in the area, which <laughs> creates potential electrocution hazards. And it's low on the ground. <laughs> Right, and so we took a picture of that. That, I believe, was in October. Um, the safety inspector noted it was a hazard. Um, since our visit, it has been subsequently fixed, but we found it troubling that it was there to begin with, and this was new construction. Um, we also observed at a, a school that had an antiquated uh, phone system that did not allow phone calls between dormitory floors and other buildings, making it difficult in case of emergency. So again, here's the safety issue. If there's a fire or a security concern, they wouldn't be able to call from one floor to the next. So those were some of the things that we observed. Um. Your statement discusses problems with recent construction of BIA facilities. What were some of the other specific problems you observed? Sure. Um, unfortunately, there are more examples. <laughs> um, we, um, we went to a school that later sent us um, information regarding a large concrete fragment that fell from the wall of a kindergarten classroom. Uh, luckily, the classroom was empty at the time, but that's a concern if you're having a new building where things are falling from the walls. You think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we've also heard from multiple schools about reported leaks, again, with new roofs um, that were, inst were installed within recent years. Um, there was also um, an incident with um, a bus barn. You may have seen pictures of that where the barn um, was used or developed so that they could uh, store and repair school buses, um, and yet it was constructed in such a way that it couldn't fit all the buses <coughs> when they were on the lifts. Um, so as a result, they le need to leave the outside door open if they want to repair a large bus, which is very difficult during the winter uh, and not very practical. So there are quite a few issues that we encountered during our visits. Well, um, obviously this leads to the question, why does Indian Affairs have such poor quality data on the condition of their schools? This is a good question and this is something that has been going on for quite some time. We've reported on this um, in the past and it continues to this day. Our understanding is that Indian Affairs does not routinely monitor whether schools are entering complete data on their facilities. So just at the very front end in terms of that first step of getting the information in, it's unclear if that's always correct or, inc or complete. And I think part of that is that um, we've been told that staff have not received training on how to do this um, and that the last centralized training on the database was offered in 2012. Ms. McCollum. I've been to the bug school, so I've seen it all <laughs> until I saw the high voltage next to a dishwasher near floor where that could flood too. So um, wonders I never cease. That. One of the, the, the things that I've noticed in some of the schools that I've, I visited um, alone and when I've been with my, um, my colleagues is the amount of, I mean, I'm not a construction person, but I look at things and it's like, I wouldn't have allowed this to happen if I was building my home, doing things with a contractor. So are we leaving um, principals and some tribal leaders out there to negotiate um, what, what's good construction and not good construction? I mean, 
I know these are isolated areas. Mm -hmm. We build mm -hmm. rural, rural schools all over Minnesota, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. our rural schools aren't falling down like this. So mm -hmm. what happens with, with, with the inspection? And then in your report, you note that there is, we don't even retain back 10% of the payments until it passes inspection. But you know, quite frankly, I don't understand how they're passing inspection to begin with in the first place. Right. Right. Now, maybe it's because I come from a union state. I don't know. I know that this, that this wouldn't that this wouldn't happen because of the skilled labor. Is it is it lack of skilled labor? Is it lack of inspections? Is it a lack of What's going on? That's an excellent question. We do know that there is a skills gap in terms of the agency not having enough folks with the right skills to assist with this issue. Um, we'll be looking at this more in depth as we go forward with our study to figure out exactly where those additional gaps are. I think it all comes down to accountability, though. These are federal funds, and they're not being used in a way that is benefiting children. Well, Mr. Chair, I've got an idea. Let's, let's take some tribal college uh, resources and funds and let's let's train up Indian country to be able to go out not only do do their own construction but be able to do their own inspections and I think that this needs to be part of our discussion thank you mr. chair certainly is mr. Simpson uh, <laughs> this is actually kind of stunning um, I was just telling congressman Cole uh, when I uh, I will guarantee you that if there was a building built or a school built and, or re-roofed anywhere in Idaho, in any community in Idaho, if it started to leak, contractors rear ends in trouble. And they better have some, uh, the prosecutor would be after them in a heartbeat as well as the school and attorneys and everything else. And I don't understand why that hasn't happened here. And it, it reminded me of, as you were talking about this, is you know the stories in the old days about the reservations and we were going to provide beef and so it was people took advantage of it and put spoiled beef on the reservations and all that kind of stuff and it's somebody's taken advantage uh, here uh, whether it's the contractors or the designers of the roof or whatever it is but somehow they've got to be held accountable and I honestly I, you know you've listened to Mr. Washburn and the other individuals t testify here today these are good people mm -hmm. and they're trying to do a good job they're, they're not just putting a blind eye to all this kind of stuff. They want the best for the tribes and the kids in these schools also. Is there something in the, in the not just the, the, the uh, number of people they need with s different specialties, but mm -hmm. is there something in the structure, organizational structure, do you know, or have you looked at that, that could bring more accountability into it uh, and what was the BIA's response to your report here? Or did they respond? I haven't read it yet, and I will oh, sure. this weekend. Um, so uh, we provided a statement of facts to uh, the Department of Interior and received comments on those facts, um, and we incorporated any changes um, in response. Um, I think there, there is general confusion among schools as to who to contact. I think there is that issue that surfaced in the earlier panel about roles and responsibilities needing to be clarified, and I think that makes it all the more difficult for schools to know who to talk to when there is a problem. Um, and so I think that that's an issue. We have previously recommended that Indian Affairs develop a communication strategy so that you can avoid some of those communication pitfalls. Um, however, that recommendation has yet to be implemented by the department, so that is one thing that could be done. Um, similarly, we have uh, made a recommendation that the department develop a workforce plan to make sure it has the right number of people with the right skills to do the work. Uh, that recommendation is still outstanding as well and has not been implemented. So those are some immediate steps that could be done to help improve the situation and we will continue to look at these issues as we move forward. Well I will tell you it, it, it gives me pause um, to uh, have confidence in the list that they're going to put together of prioritizing needs if we don't have the ability to determine what the need is out there. And, and I, I will tell you that as we've been on some of these trips, we've gone to some schools that, yeah, they need some improvements, they need some repairs, and you talk to the local people and they're going, oh, this needs to be torn down and replaced and all this kind of stuff. And I look at them and go, 
I understand why you say that, but I've been in some schools that I wouldn't walk in, that I don't feel safe walking in, mm -hmm. and this is a dream compared to them. I'm not saying this is good. <laughs> you know? right, right, it's all relative. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, right. and so it, it, it gives me pause of whether I'm going to have confidence in the prioritized list that they come out with. We, we do also have questions to the extent that they use the data from the facilities database to create that list because our understanding is that there are significant issues with that data. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much for your uh, report. And I'm a relatively new member on the committee, so I think everyone here has much more experience in looking at the schools and seeing some of these challenges. But um, you heard earlier, I'm from a state that's about to build a new school. And as you kind of mentioned, there are already so many questions about who to contact, who makes a decision, how does that get done. I can right. understand that there is a lot of um, just general confusion and I suppose it's not surprising that that happens again when it comes to oversight so I think the more recommendations that are out there about how to streamline the process how to make it seem more like what happens in other school systems when there's oversight and inspection and mm -hmm. if if a school is you know doesn't have sufficient expertise in how to make sure they're treated fairly then and if there are situations that schools aren't being treated fairly or they're rural or remote, I mean, it seems like it's a perfect storm in a way for all kinds of bad conditions. But certainly, it seems like there's universal agreement on the committee, you know, across the board and across the country that there should be more investment in school construction and there should be more creative ways to do it. And it just seems like it would be logical to build into that this kind of data collection oversight. I mean, it's going to make the money be more effectively spent and certainly it's got to be disappointing for a community that finally gets a school and then the roof leaks or it's unsafe or anything else happens. So it seems like this is good timing in that way to dig in and make sure these kinds of things are looked at. So um, I don't, I, I'm hoping that you will have a lot of recommendations about how the department you know, restructures or conducts it. And certainly, um, I mean, it seems logical that there should be more training on how people use the database and they should have more of a vested interest, mm -hmm. I guess, in making sure that data is properly collected. Right. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, feel free to elaborate on that. I don't have a specific question. Sure. I would just say that I think to help um, with the roles and responsibilities and the communication, in addition to thinking about implementing our prior recommendation on a communication strategy, they may also want to turn their attention to their directory, which has not been updated in several years. I think if people have the right contact information for folks, that can help with the communication process as well. So I think there are some small steps that can make a big difference. Thank you. Before I go to Mr. Cole, I, when you, if you can get back to me on that roofing job, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Not just I used, you. <laughs> uh, I've re roofed a lot of buildings in my lifetime and you know, right. restaurants and industrial buildings and the rest. And uh, so I have a pretty good idea what roofs cost. Now, okay. you know, so it's some, there's regional differences depending on where you put the roof. But uh, if you can get the square footage, how big the building is, uh, the largest roofing contractor in the state of California is one of my best friends. I'm going to have him look through it and see, <laughs> <laughs> and go through the bid and see, because uh, uh, he can tell me uh, how bad this probably is, and I have a feeling. Uh, Mr. Cole. <laughs> will you share that information with the committee? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure you will. Um, I'm sorry, first of all, I missed most of your testimony. I apologize. And uh, I'm like Mr. Simpson, I want to read it, but it's pretty easy to catch the flavor of your testimony and both your conclusion and then the questions that have been asked. Um, couple of questions. When you look at these schools, obviously you're doing, I you know, suppose, a, a sort of fiscal or physical and fiscal, you know, look. But mm -hmm. uh, is there any, how, what are the governance systems for these schools? I mean, we normally would think of a school board and superintendents and school boards. Are, tell me how they're governed and tell me, uh, do you see any difference between if there there are I know for instance our friends the Choctaws run their own Jones Academy school it is an unbelievable school it is physically first rate it is a wonderful education and they educate Native American kids from all over not just Choctaws uh, 
and so my experience has been, I've seen this in healthcare systems, the more the tribe is actually the manager of it, now we still have resource questions and taxation questions and all that, but if, if parents can get their hands around the neck of somebody that's responsible or can re their tribal legislators have the authority and responsibility mm -hmm. and know they'll be held accountable, uh, you know, that, that tends to make a real difference in how any institution I see is managed. Self-governance actually is usually very, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, we can definitely look into that more as we <coughs> continue on. This is really the midway point for us and we um, have more site visits to do as we go forward. Um, I would say that you know, obviously there are differences in terms of how the schools um, are run, whether they're tribally operated or BIE operated. Uh, that said, in terms of facilities management, um, Indian Affairs does play a significant role in terms of funding for schools, kind of regardless of how they're operated, whether it's BIE operated or tribally run. Um, and, in, and Indian Affairs owns the majority of those school facilities, about two-thirds. The tribes own about a third. Um, so those are some of the things that we've learned so far, and we're going to continue our exploration to see. I, I, I really would, mm -hmm. we should look at this, because again, particularly in healthcare areas, it just, uh, it, and it, I don't say this to knock uh, uh, anybody here, or the, certainly not Indian Health, but where I've seen tribes actively managing, uh, number one, if they have any revenue, they usually shift some of their own revenue into this because it is for their own people. But even beyond that, it just seems to work better. And I would assume the same thing here. So I think this is a governance issue as well. As, and I do want to pick up on something that uh, Mr. Simpson suggests and ask you to also look. I think, you know, uh, there, there's culture in contracting, too, and the history of uh, private contractors working, uh, you know, for the federal government uh, in Indian country throughout the entire history of this country has been bad. This is not a new problem. This is not something that uh, is this administration's fault. Frankly, I want to commend them for trying to get their hands on, on this and put resources in there and, and do some innovative things. And uh, this committee very much on a bipartisan basis uh, wants to do that too. But suggestions you could make about, uh, uh, you know, not only this or that, kind of, what are the contract problems? Mm -hmm. What are the availability of contracts? Many of these places are going to be built in very remote locations. Uh, we saw a detention facility with, you know, it clearly had been badly sited where literally half the building was breaking off. It was an old facility when we were in uh, Hopi country and uh, this just happens time and time again. So what are the best practices contracting wise that we can put in and uh, I guess uh, you know, are, are you looking at that as opposed to just it's bad here or that, but how do we actually go about this? How do we choose contractors? Who's responsible? I think we'll be looking into that, especially given the concerns that we found with some of the contractors that have put in those new roofs. I mean, it does definitely raises that issue of accountability, just even on the contractor side or the supplier side. Uh, in terms of, of sort of promising practices, I do want to let you know that as we go forward, we are also going to be looking at some additional models that are being done out there um, to come up with other ways of managing facilities. Uh, for example, in Oklahoma, I know four schools came together to jointly fund, I believe it was like two architects and a technician to help with their schools. So, so by having the tribes come together, they were able to jointly fund these positions that were then able to cover more schools. And so we'll be looking at that as an alternative model and others that schools may be proposing to see if those also offer um, possibilities for the department to consider maybe uh, encouraging others to adapt as well. The last thing I would ask you to look at, or maybe you are looking at it, again, and this goes back to a point Mr. Simpson made. Um, you know, there there has to be a, a means, a punitive means. You know, whether it is uh, civil fines or criminal activity, where when you've got somebody, somebody really has the authority and responsibility to go after them. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, people with the best intentions may be in Washington D.C. and not see it. Somebody on a local ground may see it and not have the ability to do it. How do you? Uh, again, develop that so that they know when they're dealing with, uh, you know, an Indian school in any state, it's like dealing with uh, one of Mr. Simpson's constituent schools that, hey, you come in here and mess with our kids, you're going to court, we're going to hold you accountable. If we bankrupt your company, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we expect, you know, value for the dollar, and we expect these are our, our uh, you know, kids going here that they're going to, somebody's going to look after them. 
Well, we're definitely talking to our lawyers <laughs> who are very familiar with options available and we'll be involving them in the report as we go forward to talk about potential remedies. Thank you. Thank you for doing the shield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. One point that both Mr. Cole and Mr. Simpson, anecdotally, when we were out there looking at these uh, various properties, it seemed to be a consistent problem was site preparation, yeah. not just on the mm -hmm. schools and the detention facilities, but on the, the housing. They, apparently nobody ever heard of civil engineering before or soils testing and that type of thing. And, and because if you build on a bad site, that could cause a lot of these problems you're talking about. If you have shifting, yeah. That can cause leaks and the rest, but uh, that's why we need to get to the to the bottom of this. And one of the schools, if I may um, say so, uh, was built on a swamp. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, we noticed that on one of the schools was built next to a flood control yeah, channel. Yeah, and the wash. You can see right. Right. There. right. Yeah. It just yeah, didn't yeah, seem like good wash. site uh, site planning. You know, uh, Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks for your testimony as troubling as it is. One of the things that uh, popped out to me in your testimony was the uh, notion that 40 percent of BIA regional facility positions are currently vacant, um, including engineers and architects and facilities managers. And I get the financial challenges, but, you know, I guess I echo Ms. McCollum's uh, comment. It seems like there would be some benefit in exploring ways to connect the Bureau's need with, uh, with post-secondary institutions that are trying to to train tribal members or, you know, work study programs, and uh, I'd certainly invite you to comment on that. Um, moreover, you, you'd recommended that BIA revise its strategic workforce plan uh, to ensure BIA is getting the administrative support that they need to be successful, and unfortunately that plan hasn't been revised. Uh, to what extent um, has GAO explored BIA's talent management practices from everything from recruitment to retention to training? Uh, to see what they what to see that what they've got actually meets meets needs. Uh, those are really helpful points. Um, to go to your earlier point, we will definitely explore the issue in terms of the links with higher education facilities to see if there are opportunities there. Um, in terms of the larger talent management or human capital examination, to my knowledge, we have not done that in recent years. We have touched on it in some of our prior work on management challenges. Um, and the like, but we have not done sort of an, an overall human capital evaluation. If that's something that the subcommittee would be interested in, we would be happy to do additional work. Thanks. Your report also highlights uh, what seems to be positive developments uh, resulting from a collabor collaborative effort in, among tribes in Oklahoma um, to, to manage their facilities. I know GAO intends to continue re reviewing that approach uh, to see what lessons can be learned from it. You, but um, do you, do you have a sense of how to compare the funding that BIA provides for those sorts of efforts through fee reimbursements as compared with the funding it makes available for regional offices to hire uh, and to retain quality staff? Not at this time, just given where we are in the study, but it's something we could certainly look into. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So is Mr. Uh, Joyce coming back? So in the other room. He didn't check this one. He didn't check. Ms. Ms. Can I ask one quick question? Okay, uh, Ms. McCollum. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Um, one of the other things, because we talked about it being remote, and you know, you probably have pr problems getting, you know, bids and all this other kind of stuff. So I have two questions. One, um, is it possible to work with the Bureau to come up with a list and see if there's a pattern where the where there's really egregious contractors and not allow these people to bid on things anymore. Um, uh, and then my second was there's another obstacle that you point out in your report on page 10 and that sometimes is just infrastructure that the school needs water pressure, water pipes, electric that's reliable, especially as, as um, and, and, I, and I, I appreciate what Mr. Mr. Cole said, we're not here to shoot any of the messengers here today because, quite frankly, people are trying to fix this problem. So we, we appreciate this and this is all in the spirit of us doing our part to help. But what, it, who, who's responsible, is that a problem? Are you going to thread that together with electric and water and sewer that come into the school? 
We have noted, um, as you point out, that these schools do face um, additional costs that other schools, for example, uh, public schools, don't face. They have to often have their own water and sewer systems. They need, may need their own fire protection systems, given their remote locations. Um, that is something that, that we have observed and is something that is relatively outside of their control. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so I think we'll be looking to see how that factors in um, to our findings as we go forward and also think about how our recommendations would affect that issue as well. I have just one quick question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. And this, you may um, want to take a pass on this. <laughs> may not want to. <laughs> may not want to respond to you. It's a it's a general question, not just about this though. Uh, about the GAO, we ask you to do studies and to report on things and investigate things and that type of stuff. And my ideas of my idea of how it works is that we ask you to go uh, look at school construction and stuff in BIA or any other subject out there in government. And you make recommendations on certain things, things that you find out. Uh, there may be a reason that an agency does something that you're unaware of that's right. perfectly legitimate and stuff. And how, what's the reception that you get generally from the agencies that GAO goes over to see? Are you seen as, are you seen as someone, because I look at it as someone to help you, a fresh set of outside right. eyes right. to look at something. Uh, or are you seen as, oh man, they're here to bust our rear end, you know, and, and uh, because it makes a difference right. in how it works out. Right. Um, I don't know if I can speak globally for, <laughs> for everyone in terms of what it feels like when uh, they hear, you know, GAO is coming to visit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that some school officials, at least on this study, have been very receptive to our efforts and are very interested in us coming to see their facilities to talk about um, the concerns that they have because they're very concerned about the environments that their students are experiencing and they want people to know what's going on. What about within the department? Um, we've also had a lot of cooperation from the department, and I would say the majority of our recommendations on this issue have been agreed to by the department. That's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Emery uh, Harris, Harris, thank you for your testimony today, especially for GAO's ongoing uh, work in this area. We'll be happy to invite you back. Once the study is complete, it'll be an interesting reading. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to come back. Yeah. So, uh, and we certainly want to thank our first panel, Mr. Washburn, uh, Mr. Black, and Mr. Russell. As I said before, we all want to, to help you succeed. Uh, our partnership overtures may cause uh, considerable grief, but we're sincere. We all have the same goal, and that's to, uh, to help the children. So uh, we thank you for your good work, and uh, we are adjourned.